I got a, I got a funny story to tell you, so I, can, I really want to get a laugh at my expense in this story from you. So if you think it's really funny, laugh really hard. If you just think it's kind of funny, laugh anyway, please. Yeah, practice it a little bit right now. <laughs> All right. I'm feeling good about this already. On Mother's Day, when Pastor Ruby ended up speaking, my family, my son, my daughters-in-law, my granddaughters, my grandson, we planned a big barbecue for, for Mother's Day. And it's out at, my, out at my son's house, and he lives just on the other side of the world, right out there by Givens Hot Springs. It's a, it's a trip that you have to plan to get out there. So uh, we're shooting for 2 o'clock to go out there and, and, and have barbecue, and, and uh, we're, gonna, we're planning on a, on a wonderful time, but my daughter-in-law, who is a mother of my three grandchildren there, had expressed that what I would like would be ice cream cake from Dairy Queen. Could you just pick up and bring ice cream cake from Dairy Queen? I said, sure, I, I can do that. I think, oh... It's a 35-minute trip out there, ice cream cake. Well, how am I going to make that work? Well, you know what happens here when, when church is out. Uh, I'm usually one of the last ones to end up leaving because people always want to talk. And, and man, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. Love to talk. And so we're hanging around the church here and, and an opportunity to pray with some people. So I got out of here just a little bit, any, a little bit late anyway, and I thought, Okay, i got to get the ice cream cake. Then my mother called and said, can you pick me up on the way out there? I don't want to have to drive all the way out there and back. So, yeah, Mom, I can pick you up too. So Renee and Christy are getting ready, and, and they're the last ones to leave out of here. I'm usually next to last. They're the last ones to get out of here. So to be out there at 2 o'clock is now turning into a real challenge. So I'm thinking about, okay, Renee and Christy, you guys need to get out of there. I'm calling them on the phone. They're expecting us for dinner at 2 o'clock. Come on, let's be there this time. <laughs> And I'm also thinking, okay, I've got to go get this ice cream cake. So how am I going to get that there? I'm going to have to have some ice. They also wanted me to bring ice. So, okay, I can get some ice. I'll get a bag of ice, and I'll get that ice cream cake, and I'll stick it all in a garbage bag. That should work. <laughs> hey, you're already laughing. Come on. This might work. This might work. So I'm running through this, this routine in my head. I, I, I've called Renee and Christy. And, Come on, you guys, now hurry up. I want to be there on time. So I've told Mom, yes, I will pick you up. And she called me about three times. Are you here yet? Are you here yet? Are you ready? Mom, I'm trying. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I've got to get this stuff done. So I, I, I am a little frazzled. And I run into Dairy Queen, and, and I get the big old cake. And, and Cassie said, very specific, I just want the regular one. I don't want one of the fancy frilly snickerdoodle stuff. The regular ice cream cake. Make sure to get a big one. There's a, you know, there's a bunch of it. So, okay. I go in there and, and I get the cake and uh, I get it paid for and, and I hurry back out to my car thinking, okay, I gotta have ice. I gotta have a garbage bag. I gotta get my mom. And we gotta be there on time this time. So I'm scrambling, and I walk outside with my cake, and, and I'm driving a, a, right now a Buick LeSabre, a, a burgundy Buick LeSabre, so I hurry out the door of the Dairy Queen, and I open the door to my car. I quickly and carefully put the cake down in the passenger seat. I sit down in the seat there really quick, and I reach up to the key, and it's like, oh, I took the keys out. And I'm wearing sweats, so I start looking in the pockets of my sweats, and it's like, oh, no. No key. So I check in my, in my pocket of my sweatshirt. No key. No key. It's like, ah. I'm looking on the floor. No key. So I get out of the car. I'm standing there, checking deeper into my pockets, looking in all the pockets. And I glance over into the, to the floorboard of the passenger side over there. And I see some high-heeled pink sandal kind of things. And I'm just like, what is that? And then I look and it's like, these are leather seats. I have gray cloth seats in my car. It's like, uh-oh. So I quickly reach in there, grab that precious cake. As I'm looking over my shoulder to see if somebody's going to whack me in the back of the head or something as I have intruded their car, slam the door to that car all of the time looking over my shoulder, went to my car, put the cake down, and the key was right there and ready to go. It's like, 
Yeah, that's what I was going, oh, on the whole time, just looking. I quickly got it into gear and got out of there. And I thought after that, I said, man, I am sure glad they did not leave the keys in their car. <laughs> Somebody would probably be bailing me out of jail. I'll be back on the phone saying, hurry up, Renee, hurry up. So. The, t <laughs> the title of my message this morning is, uh, I've titled it Power Principles. And I thought about titling it uh, Harnessing God's Power, but I, I, I really thought more about it. I thought Power Principles, principles that we live by to establish power, the power that we have been given, the authority that we've been given, there are some principles that we need to live by to end up establishing creating that power in our lives. Uh, <laughs> I didn't have to ask for a lot more laughter. That one just worked. <laughs> and it's a true story, too. That's what makes that so funny. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to revisit that. In fact, you know, as I was processing, as I was sitting in my, in my office, and I call it my prayer chair, reclined and, and thinking about it, it would be hilarious sometimes to put a camera in, in the office in my house that, that, I, that I put these messages together, that, you know, that I seek the Lord for his guidance, because sometimes I'll sit there and, and I will just get something. I'll get a, a revelation, I'll, I'll hear that voice, I'll get a word, and I'll go, oh yeah, that makes sense, that's awesome. So I can jot that down. But I, I'm talking to the Lord, but if some people were seeing that, they'd think, you are just nuts. Because when I get something that really excites me, I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah. And this is uh, one of the things that I got, and, and I really felt like th that this goofy story that I just told you, as I was sitting in the chair, the Lord brought that back to me about three different times. Seems like that, that three, that, that number three, that story back to me. And I, now, I just planned on opening with that because I just thought that was so funny at my expense. That's, that's a goofy story. I can't believe I really did that, but I did. But as I, I, he, he just kept bringing that back to me. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to use that story to open. But it's like, oh, oh, there is a word for somebody in that. And I feel like there's a word for somebody in, in that story because as I was sitting in the chair, kind of eyes closed and just you know, seeking the Lord and, and his guidance once again. And I heard kind of a, you know, cars are, a vehicle is like a ministry, a ministry or, or, or a part of your life, you know, a direction that you're going, something that carries you and moves you through life. And oftentimes it's ministry. It, it, so I think, oh, okay, yeah. And if... <laughs> And it, said, it was sitting in that parking lot right there. I was in the same parking lot. I was in the right proximity, and it was even the right color. That was the only thing that was right. It wasn't even a Buick. It was just the right color that I jumped into there. I went from a Buick to a Honda. But it's like, wow. But it was the right color. I felt like I heard from the Lord that, you know, the keys were in that car, in that vehicle, for that ministry, and it was ready. And all you had to do was just go get in the seat of the right car. Get yourself in the right seat, in the right car, and the key is ready. It's, it's ready to activate right now. You just have to turn the key because it's ready for you. But we can spend our time, and, and I, I felt like this must be a word for somebody, or if it was a word for the body, we can spend our time climbing into the wrong car over and over again and trying to get it to go to take us where we want to go or where we think we're supposed to go, but we're just in the wrong car. Does that speak to anybody this morning? Amen. We have to make sure, and we have to be paying attention, discerning properly the words that we get from him. That requires discernment to get into the right seat in the right car that has the key ready to activate that, to take you where you need to go. So the goofy car story. Uh, 
Lord turned it around for me, and, and I thought it was just to, just, just to open with here. But I also got some words early, early in the morning, about three or four mornings ago, as I was, you know, I was praying and seeking, and I just heard really clearly, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to get a download, and, and I heard, the heart motivates the flesh. Amen. The heart motivates the flesh. Well, when I start listening and, and, and processing this, I think, okay, now I need, I need to fix that. The heart is manifested in the flesh. The heart, I start thinking of, of the words that that, that should be, and, and I, I, heard, I, I felt very clearly to get up and just write down those words. This is what I want you to use, these words. The heart motivates the flesh. So, okay, I'll, I'll just write that down. So then I, I started hearing it. I'm still in bed. This is uh, sometimes, and I probably shouldn't admit this, but sometimes my prayer closet is my bed. I'll be starting at sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning or so, and I'm not, I don't get out of bed necessarily, but I'll be there and I'll be praying and I'll be listening, and, uh, and uh, that, that works as effectively for me as a prayer closet because sometimes that'll last two or three hours before I ever get up. I'm not falling back to sleep because the Lord has awakened me and starts giving me stuff and, and sometimes stuff to pray about. So my prayer closet, it's not too far from my natural closet, but it's horizontal instead of vertical. And I'm not on my knees, I'm on my back, just looking up and listening and, and seeking. But at that time, it was very clear, the heart motivates the flesh. You need to get up and write that down. So, so I wrote that one down. And then I started into, into the scriptures, and it says, Out of the abundance, Matthew 12, 24. These scriptures came to me. I get the scriptures. Then I love that iPhone because I can find them very quickly. All you have to do is just type in the first three or four words. If you remember that part right, you put those in, and it, it will send you right to the, to the scripture reference. I have lots and lots and lots of scriptures in my head and in my spirit that I have memorized, but knowing exactly where they are, Oh, thank you for Google and the iPhone. Man, what a great help that's been. So I, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 24. And I started thinking, this is something that I have written down before, and I even preached on this one time. It's like, your beliefs drive or direct your thought your beliefs direct your thoughts your thoughts drive your actions your beliefs direct your thoughts your thoughts drive your actions and Matthew 6:21 says for where your treasure is there your heart will be also this is Jesus speaking directly for where your treasure is there your heart will be also Proverbs 23, 7 says, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Something else that I've, I've written down is the heart of God. You know, David was a man after God's own heart. He, he, he was established, and, and it's written in the word David, a man after God's own heart. The heart of God is moved by your need. The hand of God is moved by your faith. The heart of God. God has a heart of love and compassion for each one of us. He loves us. He, he, he is compassionate towards us. But if we want to move the hand of God, it says, you must believe. I received three words a long time ago, years ago, that I got up and wrote down. Trust, believe, and receive. And if we want to receive from the hand of God, we must first believe and trust in him and his word. Trust, believe, receive. We will move the hand of God only by believing and having faith in him. You got that? I got several things that you could be writing down here this morning. Um, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, and the heart of God is moved by your need, but the hand of God is moved by your faith. There, God has some names, and this morning I was just thinking, you know, we, we think of him as God, but when you go through and study the names of, of God in the, in the Old Testament, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, and I 
chose three of those names this morning that are very applicable to the message that I have. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Do I believe in God? Do I trust in God? Do I truly believe that God is my provider? Do you believe that God is your provider? Then say with me, I believe. I, believe. I just thought it was awesome this morning what Tim got up here saying, let's say I believe together. It's like, yes. I, I love it when there's a common thread, when the Holy Spirit just brings a service completely together, that the message that I'm bringing is already partially delivered by the worship team. It's like, yeah, love it. Holy Spirit, you're incredible. You're amazing. I believe. Do you believe? Also, Jehovah Rapha, my healer. Do you believe that God is your healer? Not only is he your provider, he responsible for your finances, but also he is your healer? Then say, I believe. God's my healer. I believe God's my provider. Jehovah Shama, always there. The God who's always there. Do you believe he's always there with you? That he's the God that sticks closer than a brother? Yes, the God who's always there. Say, I believe. I believe. He's always there with me. One more that I wrote down, and I hope I can read my writing. Oh, dear. Jehovah Mikodish. Help me with this, Pastor Rich. Mikodishkum? Uh oh. Uh oh. M-E-K-E-D-I-S-H-K-E-M. The God who sanctifies me. The, huh? Oh, so the S-H is silent? Okay. We've heard it from the authority right there. The S-H is silent. Mikadeum. The God who sanctifies me the one who leads me, the one who cleanses me, the one who sanctifies me. Sanctification is a process that he's leading us through, that he's continually cleansing us through. But as we believe all of these things, one of the biggest challenges, a great, great challenge for me, was believing. That's why God, I think, gave me those three words such a long time ago, and they have been pivotal, pivotal kind of like a compass for me. It's like trust, believe, then receive. Trust, believe, and receive. Do you trust me? Do you believe my word? Then you will receive my blessings. Then you will receive my healings. We must believe to receive. And I go back, and, and we're, just, we're just getting ready to, uh, to take up the offering here, to receive your offering, but I just wanted to share, as we build principles, power principles, Principles for living. There is principles that if you will live by them, whether you believe in all of the aspects of God or whether you do not, God has established some universal principles that if you will live by, you will be blessed here on earth. There are principles. I'm going to say that again. There are principles that if we will live by those principles, we will be blessed by those principles you're on earth. Does everybody understand that? Yes, you can live by principles and be blessed because they are universal principles that he has created through this universe and for this universe and for the inhabitants of this universe. One of those principles is the principle of giving and is established and called tithe. The tithe is 10% of your income. And that was established back. I mean, I've heard people, we've, I, I've decided not to go into these conversations that I've seen on Facebook and some of the conversations that I've heard people and arguments that people have, have entered into. It's like, oh, that's strictly Old Covenant. That's law. That's just law. You know, one of the things that we've learned in the back room back there in VSSM and that has been uh, so firmly established in us is that, you know what, it's tough to argue with an experience that you've had when you have experienced something that the Lord has shown you or has told you directly, nobody can argue you out of that. An argument just isn't going to stand against an experience, right? Are you with me? Well, let me just share with you, and some of you have heard this before, so bear with me. Those that have not heard it, uh, 
learn something from it, please. I had, I had a great deal of struggle with, this, with the giving thing and, and, until finally, finally, I mean like I'm 20-some years into being a Christian before I really would release, or I should say begin to release my finances to turn them over to God, that trust, believe, and receive thing. That was really difficult for me to, to trust Him with my finances. It's like, man... You don't know how hard, I, I guess maybe you do know how hard I've worked for this Lord, but it has been a lot of work, and I feel like I need to save it because who knows? I'm going to save it for a rainy day. Who knows what might happen next, Lord? Well, I guess you do. But. So I had just sold, uh, well, received a, a balloon payment on a, on a business that I'd sold, and it was a $130,000 check. I'm just going to, the numbers are significant here because uh, you'll see. I got a check for $130,000. It was a balloon payment that was, uh, I wasn't actually expecting at the time. So it was a, whoa, this is a great blessing to get right now. Something that was supposed to take about five years. I got all at once. Like, wow, this, this is amazing. Thank you, Lord. And immediately, immediately, he started dealing with me about that 130 grand. And he said, you're going to pay tithe on that, right? And I said, well, yeah, well sh sure. But that's $13,000, Lord, all at once. I said, you know, and this is, this is really revealing my flesh here. I, I, I looked around and I thought, you know, I'll bet there aren't very many people in this church that give over $5,000. Maybe I should just write a check for $5,000. And I thought, because Lord, Carol, come on now. Don't be too hard on me right here. <laughs> I'm being really transparent here. I said, you know, Lord, I started a conversation, and I can even remember where I was at. I was actually standing at my back door, walking up the steps, and then back out the door, and back up the steps, and back out the door for this little conversation that was going on. This wasn't knelt down in prayer or laying uh, uh, you know, face up in my bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. This was walking up and down the stairs because I was pacing as I was having this discussion or this argument with the Lord. And I said, okay, you know all of the expenses that I had. This was not all just profit, Lord. You know, I, I can expense some things out here and it wouldn't be then $13,000. And I'll tell you, I heard just not an audible voice, but something that pierced my spirit so clearly. I heard, Lynn, you're not dealing with the IRS here. It's like, oh. <laughs> okay. So it's like, all right, Lord, you know that I deal with a lot of you know, borrowed money. I have lines of credit from here and there, and I've got some significant lines of credit. And you know how much better that looks will make me look at the bank to just keep that in my bank account for 30 days. Leaves my average daily balance higher, and you know, it, it's, it'll just be good for me to keep it in my account for 30 days. And at the end of that 30 days, Lord, I'm going to write you that check. And so, so it's like, okay, conversation over. See the hand. Conversation's done. So the next day, Renee's brother, who, who came up here, Bo, who came up and introduced Pastor Ruby here three weeks ago, that's her amazing brother, well, he came to our house. He was here at the church. He was here for a couple years, too. Anyway, and he helped build the, the sanctuary out here. He, he was overseeing that. And, and uh, man, it was an incredible blessing here at the time that he was here. And... He came to our house for dinner. Renee had invited him over for dinner. So he showed up, and I didn't know him very well yet. And it was time for dessert. We finished dinner. It was time for dessert, and Renee and, Chris, or Renee and Dana, I think, took off to go get some cake and ice cream. They needed to go to the store for ice cream or something. So I was left to entertain Bo. So I just made some casual conversation. So how's it going at the church? You know, how's the progress there? How, how are we doing? Uh, because I was not involved even a little bit in, in this, this part uh, as it was being built. I was very busy doing other things of my own, creating wealth. <laughs> uh, so he says, well, it's been going really good, but he said, we ended up having a little problem. I said, oh, well, what was the problem? He said, well, 
You know how dad runs around with a checkbook in his back pocket and, and he's always, you know, buying all of the good deals and dad is Pastor Rutson, obviously. He, he's about getting good deals, so he carries a checkbook in case he needs to write a check out. And it's the church checkbook. And it's one of those little ones that, uh, that he would have. And, and, uh, anyway, he says, and he brings it to Joyce, who was the bookkeeper at the time. And she goes through and keeps the balance up in there. He said, but she was going through and he had several of the pages that ended up stuck glued together because of something that he sat in or something. It's like, oh. She said, so we have made a $13,000 mistake in the checking account. And he says, and we just overdrew by $13,000. And I was like, are you kidding me? He says, yeah, dad's running around and he's probably going to end up putting a second mortgage on his house to get a quick line of credit to get this taken care of. He says, because we have to, this is kind of an emergency situation that he didn't know that I had a check. I'm really personal with my financial stuff. I've not talked about much of that, you know, to people, not at all back then. So I'm just, my chin has dropped open and I'm just like, okay, Lord, we're not going to argue about this anymore. This is really clear. The exact amount that he's needed is the exact amount that he had told me that I needed to write this check out for, that I should have put in the offering, but I'm saying, no, no, give me a month. Give me a month. So, so I, I said, Bo, <laughs> I'm going uh, to write you a check before you leave for that 13 grand. And he looks at me and he goes, what? So I'm going I'm to send a check with you for that 13 grand. And he's like, you get that kind of money? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't, he just looked at me really baffled. And I said, the you know, Lord's been dealing with me in that. And I, I'm supposed to write you a check for 13 grand before you leave here. You're just going to need to give me a day to transfer the money around for what I've done with it. And, uh, and he, then he started to cry. It's like, oh. Praise God. He, he works in such mysterious ways, but when he shows you, and I would have two other stories, about 10%, that made it very, very, very clear to me that his expectation of me was a minimum of 10%. A minimum of 10%. So it's like, okay, I got it, Lord. I got it. And that's one of the power principles for us to live by. If you want to be financially blessed, you will live by one of the foundational principles established clear back in Genesis. This is not something that's just in the law of Moses. This is from Genesis, uh, as you go on through Acts and in, into the New Testament, of giving. What you say? Well, the New Testament Christians, the New Covenant Christians, they didn't pay a 10% tithe. Read in Acts what they did do. They gave it all <laughs> and counted on the Lord to take care of them. It's like, oh, you know what? I'd rather go Old Covenant in this thing then. <laughs> no, but I've had experiences where the Lord has shown me personally very clearly as he has shown Abraham, who paid a 10% tithe to the priest Melchizedek and several others throughout the Bible. It's like, so why the argument about 10%? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Uh, to me, there's not an argument that holds water because I have an experience that I've heard directly from the Lord, and he has chastened me a little bit in that. And uh, that's stories for the future, the chastening part. But. So... And when we believe Jehovah Jireh, my provider, Jehovah Rapha, my healer, Jehovah Shama, the one who's always there by my side, and Jehovah, the one that Pastor Rich just talked about, the one who sanctifies me, who leads me. When we believe that, if we believe that, we don't have a problem then giving unto the Lord of our tithes and of our offerings, right? Well, if we could get the ushers to come up here, this is one of the power principles, one of the foundational elements. Now, I've heard people come and, and, and that have said to me before, you know, that's why I don't go to church, because all I hear about in church is they want my money. You know what? That is so not what it's about. If you want to be 
successful in the kingdom of God, if you want all that he has for you, if you want all that he desires for you, you'll live by these foundational principles that he has established long, long ago. I just sold a, a, a building here a week ago, and this is the first Sunday since that has happened. And I don't have to have my hand slapped too many times before I start to learn. So, Lord, let's just lift our offerings up this morning to him. And if you don't have an offering to give to him this morning, just lift your hands up to him so you will be blessed as well. I want to just speak a blessing over this congregation. And as you prepare your offerings... Father God, we, we thank you that you are such a gracious, loving God, that you hold each one of us, you hold our future in your hands, Lord. We know you're our provider. We know you're our healer. We know how much you love us. I just pray that you would increase our faith, that we would be able to trust even more in you, and to be able to release, to hold lightly onto anything that you have given us, knowing that you're our provider, that you're the one that renews, that you're the one that replenishes. We thank you, we praise you, we bless your mighty name, and we expect great things back from you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, I certainly hope that this has not been misinterpreted by anybody that would now say, well, that was the longest offering request that I've ever heard. That is a powerful teaching that each one of us need to grab onto, to hang onto, because it is a power principle. The heart of God is moved by your need, but the hand of God is moved by your faith. I want, uh, and the heart motivates the flesh. Turn with me to Romans 10, verses, we'll start with verse 9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him, in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they are sent? It is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. It's like, you know what? So who's supposed to do the preaching? Who's supposed to preach? All of us are supposed to preach. We have good news to get out there and share, don't we? The good news, the news of peace, the news of joy, to bring glad tidings. We're all called to preach. What ministry do you have? to go out and share the good news of Jesus Christ. But first, what do you have to do? We've got some really clear instructions. First, what do we have to do? Believe in our heart and confess with our mouth. How many times this morning have we said, I believe? Several times. Let's just say it again. I believe, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Well, that was really weak. I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Wow, we had an echo right there. I like that. 
And that he died for my sins. And that's where my power comes from. All right, I want to to go to a little story back. Uh, we're going to go back to Genesis. I'm, I'm stumbling here just a little bit, but when we think of righteousness and when we think of the gift of salvation and the gift of grace and the gift of righteousness, I'm going to read you some scriptures here in, a, in just a second that says, righteousness is a gift from God. Grace is a gift from God. It tells us in Romans that these two things are gifts. Have we earned righteousness? No. It is a gift from God. We're made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ when we believe that he sacrificed his life, his blood for us. We're made righteous. Okay, we become the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We are in the flow of grace the gift of grace when we believe and when we act on that righteousness. When we begin to walk out righteousness, we are living in the flow of grace. And that's where the power gets started. I, we're going we're gonna to talk about power, but I just want to... To go back to Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We go clear back to Genesis when you think of, okay, these were the stalwart men of God. These are the, are the patriarchs. There's a section of the Bible definitely dedicated to these men. There are stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so I think, what made them so important to God? It says in the Bible, it says in, in, in Romans, and it says back in the 15th chapter of Genesis, if we were to go back there, which we're not going to right now, i just tell you, read the 15th chapter of Genesis through about the 25th chapter. You can go through 10 chapters there that are amazing, incredible history. That Abraham, Abraham, the, the stalwart man of God that was told that his seeds would be as great as the stars, that his seed, that he's going to be the father of nations, he had that promise. Man, what did he do to earn that? What did he do to earn? He believed God. It said that his belief, because he believed God, was counted to him as righteousness. That Abraham was made righteous not through all of his acts and deeds, because if we go and look at the life of Abraham, what's the, one of the first goofiest things that he did? I just think him and his beautiful wife, Sarah, he, 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 he went to another land. He went into the land of the Philistines. And the king of the Philistines, he, he was worried about this. So he already told his wife, you know, sweetheart, I, I want you to collaborate with me in a little bit of a lie. You are so beautiful that I just know that somebody with more power that's more important than me is going to want to take you. So, sweetheart, I want you to be my sister. I want you to tell people you're my sister. It's like, so, you know, it's like back in Job, when you think what Job feared most came upon him. Remember that? All of the stuff early, early in Job, you know, before all of the trials that he went through, it says what Job feared most came upon him. Well, what Abraham feared most came upon him. And he'd already collaborated with his wife and says, you know, tell them you're my sister. If we run into any kind of encounters, uh, but just tell them you're my sister so they won't take my life to take you. He was more afraid of losing his life. Part of his motivation was out of fear. It's like, man, do you not trust God for that part too, Abraham? It's like, no, he, he had this fear, so... He basically lied. It was a white lie. It was a half lie because she was kind of a half sister to him. But it's like, this is my sister. He left out the part. You know, sometimes we can lie by omission. There was a partial truth. She was a half sister to him. But he didn't say, this is my wife. He said, yeah, she's beautiful. Take her. He would give up the purity of his wife and that. Uh, yeah, release her, yeah, yeah, take her, just to save himself. So, man, what kind of a stalwart, incredible man of God was that? And he had some character flaws, didn't he? Yep. Yet God kept the covenant with Abraham. He became the father of many nations, and the Abraham covenant is something that we still live by, through, and are blessed by today. 
And why? Because Abraham believed God. He was obedient to the instructions that God gave him. He heard the voice of God and was obedient to that. Did he have some character flaws? Did he tell a little white lie? Absolutely, he told a little white lie. And then when we look at the next generation, his son Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What happened with Isaac? Man, he had a beautiful wife too. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know, the, when, the, when the dad gets a beautiful wife. Yeah, just look at my son's wife over there. I got a beautiful one. He got a beautiful one. Abraham had a beautiful wife. Isaac had a beautiful wife. He had the same fear. That fear passed down to the next generation. And I'm thinking, what did he hear the story? Because this, uh, like, wow. And sure enough, when Isaac traveled into the Philistine land, the king there saw his beautiful wife and was interested in his wife. So what did Isaac do? That's my sister. You can have her. He compromised his wife and the value and purity of his wife for his safety. Now, his wife, I, 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 as I read the story, I thought, well, either she didn't go along with it or something because the transfer never took place. Now, Abraham, when he gave his wife, it, it, she was taken, she was taken into the palace, but the king never knew her. The king, they never slept together, they never hooked up because God saved her, God spared her, and kept his covenant. So God did his part and more. The God who is always there, the God who cares for him, the God who directs, the God who, yes. He came through for Abraham even in his silliness, in his character flaws, in his mistakes. So I just say this uh, and the same thing with Isaac, but God forgave them, God blessed them. And I believe that that was another one of those foreshadows that we look at. It's like, yes, God wants to bless us. God has a heart of compassion, and what moves God is our faith, the hand of God. The blessing in their lives was taken place because they trusted God, they believed God, and they obeyed God. Now, we look at our lives, and, so, and sometimes power principles, we think, oh, but I've done this, and I've done, I've done that. And I believe that's why God shows us, even the men, that, the, the incredible, powerful men of God that, that lived out covenant, that were oh, so, so prominent in the Bible, had flaws, made mistakes, but God forgave them, God blessed them because they had faith, because they loved him, because they honored him, and because they were obedient to him. So there's hope for you and me. We all have flaws. We all have mistakes. We all trip, fall, scratch our knees. But God is faithful and the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he made, what you and I have to do is call on that name, confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. I'm going to go to uh, Romans 5, 16 through 21. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation. We're talking about Adam, you know, sinned in the garden. Judgment came from that, from that offense, which resulted in condemnation. But the free gift, which came from many offenses, resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through that one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So, justification of life. It is a free gift. The gift of righteousness is a free gift. Turn with me now to Romans 4.3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what do we have to do? Believe. Believe in your heart. We're going to go back for a second. The heart motivates the flesh. If you believe in your heart... The heart motivates the flesh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be. I want to turn now to, as we begin to believe in God, as we begin to trust in God, as we begin to understand his word, I'm going to turn to Isaiah 45, 11. This is something that, Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons, and concerning the work of my hands, you command me. I read this, and it kind of scared me. It's like, but I really felt like the Lord showed me and gave me a revelation for this. 45.11 Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his Maker, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons. And I want to stop on that part, my sons, right here for a minute. Who are the sons of God? We are. We are. Yes, the hands raised up, sons of God. As for my sons, my sons. Jesus Christ, we go back to Romans, and it said Jesus Christ was the firstborn of many brethren. That's the sons and daughters of God. Jesus Christ, the first one born of many brethren. So that as it goes downstream, you and I are those. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High. So what does he tell us? I was like... Concerning the work of my hands, we're going to talk a little bit about the work of the hands of the Lord. Concerning the work of my hands, what did God send his firstborn son? What did he come to earth to do? Bring reconciliation to save us, to bring reconciliation to the lost, and to destroy the works of the devil. The works of the devil, so the works of his hands is to destroy the works of the devil and to provide redemption, sanctification, reconciliation to a lost world, right? Are you all with me? So he has given us the authority to command the works of his hands. It's like, okay. The first time I read that, I said, ah, I don't know. I was just, in fact, the first time, the fifth time, the tenth time, I said, I'll leave that alone. We don't command God. We do not command God. It's like, no, no, no. But this morning, I felt like I just got a whole other revelation. It's like the works of his hands. The works of his hands were creation. He created all things. He created the earth, the Garden of Eden. And then he said, then he created man, and he said, take dominion over my creation. He said, I want you to take dominion over my creation. So the work of his hands was, our, was creation. The work of his hands was, <laughs> when he sent Jesus Christ, the work of his hands was to destroy the works of the devil and bring reconciliation to lost man. And gave us the command of the works of his hands. Is this making sense yet? It's like, oh, wow. Thank you, God. I mean, I've left that alone because it just sounded scary to me for a long time. It's like, I do not command God. But he says, yes, the works of my hands I have given you to command. It's getting quiet, but I'm seeing heads shake. Yes, it, it, it is making sense here. I, wow. Well. 
We command demons to flee. We command sickness to leave. We command healing come into this body. There are all kinds of things that he's given us. You know, command, 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 command. And that's the works of his hands. We all got that. He's given us the authority to command the work of his hands. Let's say, I accept. All right, so five people have accepted that authority. <laughs> Nobody else wants it this morning? I accept. I accept. Maybe we could do that all together on three now. One, two, three. I accept that authority to command the works of his hands. That's what he's calling us to do, to step into a new level of authority as he, through, <laughs> to command the work of his hands. I, I started studying the work of his hands. It talks about the work of his hands. There's over 100, over 100, I think 120 some scriptures that talk about the work of his hands. If you want to go in and study the work of his hands, the work of his hands, he's given us authority to command the work of his hands established us to command the work of his hands as sons and daughters. Now, I believe that there are some things that we need to do to establish ourselves as sons and daughters. Now, we're saved when we believe, but when you start reading through, uh, like, uh, let's just take the prodigal son, for example, or, or take Jesus. Take Jesus. He was 30 years old before he was acknowledged as, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus had definitely taken some steps and he was baptized. And I, don't, I think we're children of God to a point. And then we become sons and daughters, acknowledged as sons and daughters. Does this make sense now? Okay. That as we walk in righteousness, as we strive to please God out of a love in our heart for Him, He then starts to pat us on the back, introduces us to the world, and says, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my daughter that I want to introduce to you. And I have given them authority to command my hands. Okay, I got just a couple more scriptures, and then what I want to do, uh, the activation of the laying on of hands. I told you I had three messages for you this morning, so you thought I was joking, didn't you? <laughs> the laying on of hands. Uh, the theme is hands, laid hands. Uh, instead of turning to every one of these, because I want to have some, some ministry time here at the end. Uh, in Acts 9.17... We read about the story of Paul, you know, how Paul, uh, Jesus came and, and Paul ended up with scales on his eyes on the road to Damascus and he was then taken. Some people took him to uh, Ananias and when he came before Ananias, he laid hands on Paul. The scales dropped off his eyes and he prayed for him and he received the Holy Spirit. He received his sight and he received the Holy Spirit when hands were laid upon him and, and he was prayed for. Uh, in Acts 19.6, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. In Acts 13.3, they laid hands on them and sent them out. So they were commissioned, but they were laid hands on. There's an impartation when hands are laid on. There's healing when hands are laid on. Uh, my grandson just slipped out of here. I, I tried so hard to get him to come up here so I could hand him a mic and have him share what happened yesterday morning, but... He said, no, Papa, no, Papa, no. My big, strong grandson would not get up here and hold a microphone. But yesterday morning, uh, one of our friends, Jeff Deaton, who's, who's been in this church, and, I, and uh, I'm prophesying will be in this church, but I believe so. But Jeff, he's doing a roofing job, and, and he's really been struggling with, uh, with his knee. He came in yesterday morning into our house, into our kitchen, to pick up Tanner, who spent the night with him, who's helping him do a roofing job. And Jeff came in and was, was struggling. He's got a brace on his knee, and he was kind of limping in there. And I'm sitting 
listening to Jeff talking about he's gone to see a specialist uh, for uh, determining if it's rheumatoid arthritis or what's wrong with his knee because it's just been killing him and he's trying to kill him. I shouldn't say that, but it's really been troubling him. And he's up working on, on a roof and it's just making it worse and worse. He said this morning I could hardly get my sock and my shoe on because the thing just won't bend. And he said I'm trying to be up there on that roof with these guys and, and I'm just, I was really struggling. So my wife, you know, I just talk slow. I react a little slow. That's, that's my reason here. She jumped in and said, well, let us pray for you. <laughs> and so he said, okay. She said, can we pray for you? Yeah, that'll be okay. So Jeff is standing in the middle of our kitchen, and we got out the, the olive oil and smeared him down. No, we anointed him with oil, <laughs> and, and we prayed over over Jeff because he's in extreme pain he's struggling and like I said can't get his shoe and his sock on and so so we laid hands on him laid hands is the part here laid hands on on Jeff and uh, I drug Tanner he, he's sitting there eating watching come on Tanner get your hands in this too so we put laid hands on Jeff and, and, and prayed over him and and uh, <laughs> it's so funny sometimes what what the laying on of hands will do but I'm praying for Jeff, put a hand on his head, and then Jeff starts to do the, started to wobble just a little bit, and started to wobble because you could really feel a heavy presence of God. You know, the Holy Spirit just dropped right in in that, in that little meeting we had there just before they went to work. And, and then so we got down on our knees and, and, and uh, took the brace off, and I wrapped my hands around his knee, and Renee had her knees, her knees. <laughs> <laughs> Renee had her hands on his shoulders. <laughs> She, was, she wasn't doing a piggyback ride. Hands on his shoulders. I had my hands wrapped around the bad knee, the good knee, the good knee, the good knee, the injured knee. And Tanner went over there, and, and he put his hands on, on Jeff as well. We anointed him. We prayed for him and said, Okay, hey, Jeff, how's it feel? He says, Try something that you couldn't do when you walked in here. Well, for one thing, his brace is off, and he goes, Standing on one leg, and then he goes, wow. He says, I, I couldn't even think about doing that. I couldn't even think about it. So they started doing deeper knee bends, and it's like, he said, yeah, wow, that, that doesn't hurt. He said, it's, it's still a little stiff. And I said, well, let us pray again. So we laid hands, and we prayed again. And he just, Jeff just started to smile because the pain was gone then. It's like, it's going, yeah, yeah, wow. You know, thank you, Jesus. So uh, we just had a little thank you, Jesus, a little praise time right there for just a, just a minute or two, praising the Lord for what he had just done for Jeff. And Jeff spent the day up on the roof without wearing his brace, without the pain. He told Tanner, he said, he told Tanner, he said, you know, it, it's still a little, just a little stiff, a little bit tender. He says, but it is 75% healed right now. And he said, I only had 5% use when I got to your papa's house this morning. He said, so, so we just praise God for what happens. When we, and I don't say we, but when we lay hands on people to command the works of of God to destroy the works of the devil, which is injury, sickness, and stuff. We, we command. We command arthritis. We command sickness. We command pain to leave in Jesus' name. And we get to see it work because we are sons and daughters of the Most High. And He honors that in us because we believe, we trust. We love and we command as we receive. I'm going to go down to oh, Acts 5.12. We're going to read Acts 5.12. Acts 5.12. didn't write anything after it, so I'm just going to hope it's the one that I think it is. <laughs> it is, yes. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders 
we're done among the people. And who's the people? We're the people. We're the people. Many signs and wonders. Signs and wonders will follow those who, what? Believe. Believe. There's power and authority when we believe. When we trust in God and when we believe in His Word. Signs and wonders will follow. There's impartation that takes place. Again, I say impartation. And I want to go to 2 Timothy 1.6. 2 Timothy 1.6. This is where Paul is saying, Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Paul the Apostle is Paul the Impossible. Paul the Apostle did many, many impossible things through the laying on of his hands. And I want to call the prayer team up here, and I want to call Pastors Rutson and Pastors Mincer and Renee and Christy Lynn as well. Uh, with a prayer team to come up here because I believe this morning that there is a time of impartation of the laying on of hands that God wants to release some people, that God wants to heal some people, that God wants to deliver some people this morning, but that there are many, many gifts that if I'd like the pastors to come right to the middle, the pastors to the middle, please. I can start listing the gifts that these uh, pastors, Norm and Ruby, in, in the middle, Renee next to them, Christy right next to Kathy. <laughs> it's like this is the tip of the spear. This is like the tip of the spear right here. You know, the, 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 these are, are tried and tested, been through the battle. The, these are the anointed Everyone up here has, is carrying an anointing. Everyone that up here is carrying an anointing. And I believe this morning that God wants to impart to each one of you that's raised your hands and said, Yes, I receive it. Yes, I receive it. That this morning there is an impartation. And I believe everyone should come forward here to end up receiving the impartation. That as you would walk by, come first through the middle, down the aisles, come first through the pastors. and re-